Okay, so uh, good evening um, and welcome to another uh, live stream. Um, we've been beset by all sorts of technical problems here all day, um, which is unbelievable. Uh, we managed to uh, to buy a new laptop, um, but it was broken straight out of the out of the box, which was great. Uh, it was supposed to improve all the uh, uh, all the streaming and everything. So, and then um, the the PC was working okay at, at, at five o'clock and it just came and started setting things up about half an hour ago and it was all going wrong. So we're all a bit flustered here, um, but hopefully we'll be okay. Um, it's saying there's no drop frames or anything like that. Um, we're sending out a nice band, uh, nice uh, bit rate. So please let us know um, if there's any issues uh, in the chat. So, we will uh, we'll persevere. So I might be a little bit kind of like uh, off topic. So I've not written enough of my notes down on the board just yet, but um, but we'll 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 manage somehow. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about larch today, <coughs> and um, larch is one of my favourite species, in a sense because um, I have a soft spot for them in this because they kind of taught me a lot of things, uh, and working with them and thinking about them have taught me a lot of things and changed my mindset from. Um, when I was uh, sort of just coming back from, from, from Japan and I was uh, just beginning to kind of like work um, by myself um, and do workshops and, and, and things like that. And uh, Larch showed me um, some of the difficulties that you can have when applying um, a lot of the sort of the, the pure Japanese mentality to, um, to different species. Uh, and the results can often be um, not as good as they, they can be if you change your mindset. Um, if you, if, you, if you understand what I mean, uh, and I, how this sort of came about was um, I was going up to uh, I went up to Willowbog Bonsai where um, there are a lot of larch um, growing in the wilderness up and, up and around there. So if you don't know what where Willowbog is, uh, it's up in um, near, on the edges of uh, the Kiola Forest, um, and there's lots of um, plantations of larch around there, and they all grow very very straight. Um, there are a number of um, kind of like uh, trees that grow out in the wild, so to speak, rather than in uh, in, in the forests. Uh, and there's a couple that you kind of like um, drive past um, on the way up there. And the kind of the, the the way in which they grow and the way the branches sort of come out were just beautiful, um, sort of year round, and they really sort of captivated me. Um, and then I was sort of seeing lots of the the images of, of the the larch that were that were being created, uh, and the, all of those larch uh, I should say are Japanese larch um, rather than uh, the European larch. Uh, so most of the talk that we're going to have today will be um, around Japanese larch, which are the majority of the trees in the UK um, are. Um, however, a lot of the same principles will apply to, to, to European larch um, and also American larch. And we'll, we'll, we'll sort of mention that um, uh, later. Okay, good. So all the streams are okay. Just checking the chat there. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of uh, Japanese larch in the landscape, um, mainly sort of bolt straight trees. But there were those couple of, of, of them that were, were, were really wild looking trees. Um, and... I uh, sort of saw those um, images and and saw what people were doing with the bonsai um, and the, there was a bit of a disconnect there. Um, I, I was already starting to feel this way about um, a lot of the deciduous trees because in the UK the landscape um, when you're driving around in the winter it's very bleak and, and, um, and desolate because the majority of our landscape is made up of, of deciduous trees and since they lose their leaves um, there's quite a you know, there's not a lot of, of, of green around uh, and so you see all of these beautiful sort of deciduous images as you're driving around um, or walking around and um, I wasn't seeing that kind of uh, represented in, in, in the bonsai that I was I was kind of like seeing and working on uh, and so there was this kind of like well why is that type of uh, feeling which is starting to, to, to come to the surface uh, and I was sort of seeing people working with with a lot of Japanese larch and seeing how some of the the older, more mature trees um, were starting to reach a point where they were becoming very, very coarse. Um, and it led me to think about how long term 
cultivation of, of larch bonsai is quite difficult. Uh, and when we're talking about long term, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50 years long term. Uh, one of the reasons for this is, is due to the coarseness of the growth. Uh, Japanese larch in particular, um, if you don't apply certain thinning out techniques um, and uh, look at the coarseness of branches and the coarseness of growth, then you will end up with very short, stubby, arthritic looking branches. Um, and this made me question why in the UK I was using Japanese larch material uh, for bonsai when in Japan there wasn't any Japanese larch at all. Um, I knew that there had previously been a lot of Japanese larch, so going back through the history books, um, all the exhibition uh, catalogues, um, back to you know, 50, 60, 70 years previous and 100 years previous, you used to see um, quite a few examples of Japanese larch. Obviously they grew wild um, in Japan and there was uh, you know, some places where Yamadori uh, trees um, were, was able to collect. And so there was a, a history of using them, but over time you started to see progressively less and uh, you know fewer and fewer trees, um, sort of in exhibitions, and they were tending to get become sort of very coarse and very clunky, and the number of branches on them were becoming less and less and less, um, because there was this issue with the branches becoming thick and coarse and too heavy for the designs, and so. When you are restricting them and restricting them and restricting them, stopping them from, from elongating out and growing, what tends to then happen is that you end up with branches without any taper, and that's what a lot of people um, I've found have, have suffered with, and, um, and myself as well. And so I have to just sort of thinking about that, and then also sort of thinking about the stylings of, of, of a lot of those trees. So we're seeing these, a lot of this material which was being kind of put into to, to, to sort of traditional Japanese. Uh, conifer type images uh, and just sort of seeing some, some kind of like I don't know, disconnect is possibly the word or just some uncertainty there um, sort of led me to sort of think and reevaluate um, large at first I really disliked them uh, because of that coarseness um, in, in the branches because uh, I, I do tend to favor sort of lighter and elegant trees and those sort of super heavy thick trunks with, with thick gnarly branches were were not to my taste and I instantly kind of like dismissed Japanese larch as just not worthy of, of, of being pursued as a as a bonsai uh, species um, however after a couple of years and just sort of thinking about it I kind of changed my, my the way of thinking and my mindset um, and kind of approached them in a different way um, looking at rather than taking inspiration from the kokufu you know the Japanese uh, um, exhibition aesthetics and you know those types of things rather than you know sort of trying to look at um, trees in the landscape and how they grow and how we could look at representing those types of trees uh, in bonsai form um, and not just over a short time but over a long time and still kind of trying to, to figure out that process um, and a lot of the things that we're doing have been have had some good results and, and some not so good results um, so that's kind of like where my um, relationship with Larch uh, comes uh, sort of come about and why they have a, a, a really nice uh, I have a soft spot for them uh, and we'll sort of, you know these topics and the, these ideas will come up a little bit as we as we sort of discuss um, the intricacies of Larch and such like um, but as I said basically um, the majority of the trees that we work with uh, in the UK are Japanese larch forestry type trees or you know trees that have become self seeded um outside of of um of um, uh, you know near near forests and such like uh and so they tend to be generally quite straight trees um uh or young trees um is, is, you know so it's, it's quite a few of the things that you sort of tend to see because they don't grow in like the severe environments and once you start moving into to European larch and, uh, and getting some of those um, sort of Yamadori pieces, um, then you start to see completely different characteristics like phenomenal bark and lots of twists and movements and things like that, which we don't tend to see in the marketplace here too often. It's quite difficult to get hold of trees like that. Um, and um, 
the growth habit of the European large as well is, is slightly less coarse growing. And so some of the concepts and ideas that we need, might need to apply to the Japanese large is are slightly different for, for the European large. And they're, they're kind of like a lifespan, as it were. Um, it might be uh, a little bit sort of longer in terms of uh, you know the, the coarseness of branches. So um, there is uh, the one thing I should sort of say is there are some not uh, in the UK because we don't really have that many European larch going around, but there there is a like a crossover between the two as well. It's called a Dunkeld larch, which I've never seen, um, but if anybody out there has used them and seen them uh, and used used them as bonsai, then let me know how they go. Um, but really, uh, I think what we need to just sort of how we need to look at it is just kind of look at how they grow, um, kind of like natively, and try and take some sort of inspiration from that, and also understand uh, how that growth habit needs to be addressed in terms of the sort of the bonsai cultivation. Uh, and so here we have some images of um, Japanese larch large in the landscape um you know, not just japanese but european large but you know so uh large in the landscape across europe uh, and this image here is is kind of like the the thing that really kind of uh, captivated me uh this is up in scotland somewhere um i just scabbed this off the internet earlier uh but so driving up to willabog um there are a couple of trees that are not quite as as uh, impressive as mature as the as the, the you know the big specimen on the on the left there um but sort of kind of like halfway in between the the very youthful um upright tree of the on the on the right uh, and the more mature specimen on the on on the left uh but they don't look anything like um the types of trees that we see um represented in in, in bonsai form uh, and if you note you see the a lot of the branches on the more mature tree are dropping down and, and sort of touching the ground uh, and then once we get move up into the top of the tree, we see all of these sort of, uh, very long, um, sort of energetic, uh, forceful branches kind of like growing up and out um, uh, of. I mean, this is a like this will be a, 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 um, a sort of. You can see like it's almost like a candelabra type effect, uh, and there are uh, a couple of younger trees in and around there, um, so it's a kind of like a multi trunk, a multi tree. Um, I don't know, you could call it a group there. Uh, but there's this, you know, the energetic kind of shooting out um, growth up in the top uh, is, is very kind of typical of, of larch. And you, you see that apical dominant uh, growth habit in, in this. Okay, so the, those long branches which are drooping down, they're being forced down by uh, by the by the, the auxin producing um, tips in the, in the top of the tree, uh, really kind of reducing the, you know, sort of forcing them down also the weight of the snow that would be that would be on them during the winter um, so the the effect of the the landscape and the the, the natural growth habit uh, is, is clear to see there uh, this is a much more mature kind of single specimen tree um, that we would see uh, and you can see that very kind of uh, almost deciduous like uh, image uh, and that again is one of the things that really kind of like appealed to me about some of the more mature looking larch, uh, seeing them um, when they've lost their, their their needles in the in the winter, you see kind of uh, cross between deciduous type images and um, and, you know, and and coniferous, and so it was a really interesting you know sort of hybrid. But you, yeah, if you didn't know that that was a larch. Um, and somebody said, "Oh, that's a deciduous tree." You, you, you know, at first glance, that, that that could happen, but that big mature apex, the the branches which are sort of very long, thin, and slender. Much younger tree up in the Alps, so this would be a, a, a European larch, but bolt straight up, uh, and all the trees around them uh, are bolt straight up with those very thin-looking branches. Uh, and they're, you know, a, a forest of, of, of those growing around a lake, obviously, with the, the lovely golden um, autumnal foliage. So, you know, looking at those sort of images, we don't tend to see those in bonsai other than, say, some of the large sort of forest plantings that you might see. Um, you know, that sort of final image of a lot of those sort of bolt straight um, trunks. Um, that more mature looking almost sort of deciduous, the big spreading flat, uh, flat crown 
type of um, uh, mature large type of image is, is was one that I sort of hadn't tend to see um, uh, very much of. And so looking at that, I was have been trying to sort of uh, pursue that um, that image and, and that sort of styling. Uh, finding the right material is it can be difficult. I do have one trim. We will look at that later. Um, but the the, the sort of one of the things you say that with the younger trees, with them being you know sort of very bolt straight uh, and those straight long branches that, that that come out and that kind of like explosive growth uh, and the importance of kind of like the um, the the auction producing apical dominance um, is something that we kind of need to uh, to to understand. Uh, when we're looking at how to deal with the foliage and one of the it, the biggest issues that people have with with larch um, is is stopping that growth from from happening okay so they're designed they they want to grow they want to grow out kind of like explosively um in big long straight lines and so when you when you take that kind of natural desire to grow out like that and you start to to really kind of control it and push it back in um, the tree is not going to like it and a lot of people have sort of um, contacted me and said can you talk about sudden branch death on, on larch and it's not something I've ever really sort of suffered from personally um, with one of my larger trees that we'll look at later th there is a bit of, um, of a weaker branch death um, lower branches uh, and inner branches sort of dying off um, but that was almost um, planned uh, on, on my part uh, but just kind of like trees just dying off um, for no apparent reason uh, or, you know half the tree branches dying off for no apparent reason if you've allowed the tree to grow a lot extend out then generally that shouldn't be happening okay larch do have a tendency to be a little bit kind of um, touchy finickety like if once once they've been repotted um, there is a there's a relatively short window of opportunity for for repotting them we don't want to be repotting them once they're really starting to push the growth uh, and so and doing them a little bit too early as well can be uh, detrimental to to to, to the, their health going forward and so generally what you'll be looking to do when you're repotting larch is is to try and get them just as their the buds are beginning to to sort of show signs of swelling up once they've opened up and really pushed out then for most people it's probably a bad idea to to go in there because the aftercare that's required you know putting them in a polytunnel and misting them and things like that might be beyond uh, a lot of people um so so really there's like quite a um a short window of opportunity for repotting and also being too aggressive when when repotting i found has always been um on particularly on the more uh, established trees uh, when we're looking at kind of um freshly collected very young and super vigorous trees then they they will withstand um quite a bit more aggressive repotting but the older they get the 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 more tender or more delicate you have to be with with, with repotting techniques uh, and so I don't, most of the trees that I have, I, t I try to not repot them um, once they've kind of got into a bonsai pot. Try and leave it as long as possible, just maybe a little bit of a re refreshing of the of the topsoil. Um, I have made a couple of mistakes, including with this um, strange looking uh, larch behind me, uh, in terms of the, the, the roots and, and, and how far you can push them. Uh, the tree that I have the most success with and other sort of customers and clients that have trees larches that do the best are those that where the roots tend to not get messed around with too frequently uh, and or too aggressively so try to leave them as long as possible um, but just ensuring that water can kind of get in has been um, quite a successful way of dealing with them uh, in terms of soil mixture what we've tended to do is um, slightly more akadama uh, pumice lava mix so ever so maybe a little bit more akadama in there uh, and also uh, just a like a a handful of sphagnum moss pine bark some some type of organic material in there uh, in the same way that we would do with the beach um because the the mycorrhiza is very very important for um for for, for larch as well if like a, a super healthy larch um, when you come to, to to repot them, there'll be that musky smell. You can you can see, um, not as much as, as with the pine, but you can definitely smell smell and <laughs> taste the, the the presence of mycorrhiza in there. And so having that, just putting a little bit of um, organic material, sphagnum moss, for example, in there uh, when repotting 
helps that to really kind of like grow and colonize. And so I would always just, just put a little bit there. Don't put too much in because then, then you start to lose the um, ability to control uh, moisture levels and fertilizer levels uh, within the pot um, you know, going forward long term. Um, but just, just a little, um, you know, sort of 5%, you know, a handful in there just to, to help to colonize, to, to really kind of um, get the, the, that mycorrhizal development going um, initially uh, is, is a good idea. Right, still with me. Uh, okay, yeah, no questions yet. Right. Um, if anybody does have any questions, as previously mentioned, just preface it with question uh, and then we'll get to it. I'll, I'll answer them during some videos. We've got some coming up. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the kind of the root aspect of, of, of large. Um, and then we sort of get onto to the foliage management, which is one of the things that I feel most people have, have been applying, as I said, that kind of like that, that Japanese ideas and, uh, uh, too. And that's not to say that kind of like pinching out quite, quite a lot, uh, you know, as things start to grow out and pinch, 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 hasn't been successful for some people. Um, but for most people, uh, it, it can end up with with issues of you know sort of, as you know the, the sudden branch death um, and the coarseness of of of, um, of of the branches and the the density of those branches sort of coming up quite quickly. So there is an aesthetic uh, reason for for not going in and pinching all the time, uh, and there's also a, a health reason for for coming in and perhaps allowing a little bit of extension out. And so you've got these two concepts at play um, when looking at dealing with the foliage. You want to try and keep the tree healthy and growing, but you don't want to let, you don't want to let it grow too much and the base of the branches to become coarse. You don't want to pinch it too much because then the branches become coarse. And so this really kind of like this this difficult um, way of um, balancing that is 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 the the real challenge with larch. Uh, and one of the things that most people don't tend to do is to thin out the branches so much. Um, uh, and so we'll sort of talk about that um, in one of the videos and, and, and sort of going forward. But really what we tend to do here is not pinch the, the that initial flush of growth too much. Okay, so uh, this tree's just been repotted. Uh, this is a fairly weak tree. This one, uh, there's a video of it being still styled. Um, we don't tend to, to pinch out that growth uh, unless we start to see anything kind of like real rampantly going away and and the balance of the tree uh, becoming unbalanced, uh, becoming out, out of control. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is we, we want to have, or I want to have, um, a lot of that kind of lovely, soft, fresh um, growth. The more we can have on there, um, particularly during the summer, the better. Uh, we don't suffer from excessively hot um, uh, summers in, in the UK um, but large need that foliage mass they need particularly that youthful juvenile stuff they need that foliage mass in order to, to cool themselves down uh, they will grow in kind of hot environments but only if they can you know, only if they can grow out if they get cut back and, and, and they um, are restricted too much they don't have that ability to, to build the surface area in order to, to lose a lot of the, the heat that, that, that occurs uh, builds up within them whereas if they had all of that soft luscious extension foliage like they should do in the wild then they do okay so bearing in mind where you are in the world thinking about the the amount of extensions that you need uh, in order to, to help the, you know keep the tree cool is, is one thing however if we go back to the idea of we allow it to extend off too much the branches become coarse and we end up with aesthetic problems so there's a balancing act. The other thing to, 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 to bear in mind is the more that the, the growth happens at the tip, the less that's happening on the inside. So again, looking at balancing it up, allowing the, the shoots on the inside to grow out by restricting the tip a little bit, but not too much. Okay. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things that we need, that we need to look at uh, balancing. Uh, and some of those ideas will be discussed in some of the videos. So what we'll look at uh, to begin with is um, the styling of this uh, piece of material here, um, which is a very basic kind of um, Yamadori collected piece. 
Uh, I got this, I think, from Ian Young, actually, in um, in Ireland. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just a, a very sort of simple piece. It wasn't uh, ridiculously expensive, uh, but it just sort of shows the um, kind of the, the way in which we look to try and uh, create something that will end up looking like one of those um, uh, more mature looking larches, the, the images that we saw there. So we have a collected larch. This is, would be uh, from the edge of a forestry uh, type situation. Uh, Self-seeded larch seedling collected. It's still in sphagnum moss uh, that it was collected in. Um, you can see really good root development. The one thing you have to be careful about when it's in just pure sphagnum is it not getting too wet um, and the roots kind of like dying off because of uh, a lack of oxygen. Uh, you've just got to make sure that it, it, it's, it's able to dry out. Um, and then we'll be looking at repotting that quite soon. So this has just been allowed to grow off and get strong and healthy. So one cut back there, you can see it callousing over on the top. We have one very strong branch here and another one there and two major lines up in the top of the tree. So what we're going to look at is just a very simple initial styling of this tree. So first thing I would want to do is to look to get rid of this tiny little shoot at the bottom. Okay, that's not going to turn into a branch. And this weak shoot down here too. We have got multiple branches all coming from very similar positions in here. And a, a youthful shoot coming from the base of one of those branches there. Uh, this branch is not going to be used because it's trying to fill the same sort of space as this branch here and also it's coming from the base of another more important branch. So we can just get rid of that one to begin with, there's no need for that. Just simplify that trunk line, another little shoot coming from in that same space, we can get rid of that. Okay. Just having done that, now we can simplify, simplify the lines up there and we can see the trunk and those important lines a lot more clearly. So now we need to look at which of these we're going to use. Now this strong line here is out of keeping with the other branches. So one, two, three, four, five are all of the same relative thickness. They're all pencil thickness, whereas this is twice as thick. So we either have to use this as a major feature or we get rid of it and work with the others. So what we can look at doing is just cover that over, look at bringing this one down, maybe back up again, doing something similar with that one, pushing that one out the back. So that works. The other alternative would be to remove this one and Drop that down, and across and out. I think with the, the thickness of the trunk and the elegant image that we, we, can, we can look to create, uh, removing this branch would be the best thing to do. Okay, just purely on that basis of wishing to use the verticality of the tree. Okay, so the trunk is very, very straight. There's no getting away from that. And so if we can try and keep everything in a kind of like a vertical feel rather than pushing things down, that would be the best way forward. The other alternative would be to push this one up, try and make like a candelabra, but then we have issues with the thickness of that branch that I don't particularly like. So I want to get rid of this one as well. No real need for a, for a, for a gin. Uh, just having removed that big one there, we now sort of simplified things out. We come up into this top section, which is what we want to do. So now we just have to look at what we do with those branches. So we'll just apply a little bit of wire to them. Now it's not the best time of year to be doing this. Um, the best time to sort of wire larch is when they are, um, when, before the, the, the new foliage comes out. So I wouldn't uh, advise going in and, uh, and doing too much uh, at the moment. We're just doing this so we can have um, we could discuss kind of the, 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 the styling of larch uh, and sort of how I see it. Um, so don't go out and wire your larch now. Wait until the, the, the needles drop off 
uh, or sort of in the spring before the, the buds break. So we're just gonna, using sort of 3.5 mil wire, aluminium wire, just kind of loosely go around the, the branches. Uh, but before we do that, I'm just gonna remove these little shoots right from the base in there. When we're wiring, we're gonna wire two branches together, one coil around there, one coil around here. Okay, so because larch have a tendency to thicken very rapidly, I'm not going to, to wire very tightly. So there will be slight spacing in between the branches, just carefully. My left hand supporting the branch as we're wiring. Just move things out of the way. Come round. And we'll just take it along this major line, the thickest part of, of the branch. Try not to trap any of that delicate foliage. So if you're wiring at the correct time of year, then there will be no foliage on there to avoid. So we're going to look at pushing this branch down, 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 and then back up. And we'll just give it a little bit of a tweak so that rather than it being very flat, we just rotated it ever so slightly. And so we're now seeing a lot more of that foliage. What we can do with another wire is then just push that up and continue the, the, the downward growth here. So something similar along this line. That initial movement just downwards and then that downward movement can be continued with the secondary branch flowing outwards from the trunk gets this branch division, then it can move upwards. So we're gonna want just one more wire on there to, to finish that off. Larch have a tendency to send out two branches from the same position. So what we'll do is we'll remove one of them. The reason why we chose this one is because we have another branch on the right hand side. So it goes left, right, left, right as we go along the branch. So just by straightening this section up here, we've given ourselves a lot more height. And if we push this branch up, so it mirrors that initial movement of the leader, but then comes out and then back up, we get some interesting movement. But we have that definite main apex, strong branch, apical dominance being exhibited up there. Now we just need to look at this branch around here. So what we need to do is to make sure that this branch and this branch are filling different spaces, okay, or different heights. So at this point here, we can have that initial move upward movement. So it came to a point where one, two, three branches were all trying to grow up and compete to become the apex. This one won, this one came second, this one came third. So we can have a slight upward movement. Then we come down, out. And then once that starts to get further and further away from the trunk, we can start to see some upward movement. So that's the primary branching structure set. Now what we can do is just a little bit of secondary wiring, but not too much because it's not the greatest time of year to do so. And what we'll do is just have that flowing nicely down and away from the trunk. And we'll look at trying to just create a couple of different levels here where we have that big strong branch division. And we have a third branch going upwards. That one can come out, flow down. Okay, it's still very raw there, but you can see what we're trying to achieve. So all we're really interested in at the moment is the, the lines of the branches rather than the foliage too much. Two branches very close to each other here. We'll take this one off because it's gonna be interfering with our second line up here. Again, two branches coming from the same position there. We'll take that one off. 
that one's okay. So we have that, that good separation between one, and two, three, four, five, six, as we're going up through the top there. Just take off any of those shoots that are right at the base, to stop any excessive growth at the base and making it become coarse. So what we need to look at is the, the space that this branch here is filling. Let me just try and push it a little bit further out towards the back and then push that branch down. So we don't want them to be interfering and filling the, and, and filling the same space. Now just look at the top here. Now because larch uh, have a tendency to grow and uh, thicken up very rapidly, they should be loosely wired, uh, nothing too, too fine gauge as well. Okay, so definitely nothing less than two mil, particularly at this time of year. So the image that we want for our apex is going to be quite a wide, flat spreading one rather than a rounded dome, something which is typical of larch rather than typical of bonsai. So if we do that, we lose the elegance, flatten it down, bring everything down, we lose all of that elegance. Keep it nice and tall. We have that nice separation. The space between these branches becomes a lot more attractive. So what we'll do is we'll allow these to grow out a little bit. Come back in and cut them back. And start to build up our apex here rather than squashing it down. These other branches, they can be wired in due course. Right, but now is not the time to be doing it. So with just one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of wire and a few branches removed, we've turned that into something which looks a bit more like an elegant, natural, larch. Okay, so we tried to capture the, the youthful vigour initially of the larch, that kind of upward and that explosive type of growth and just how kind of like elegant those, those branches can be. Um, so rather than try and compact everything and like particularly the apex, try and squish it down uh, and put loads of movement in those branches in order to, to, to kind of get everything close to the trunk like we perhaps would be looking at doing with, um, say, juniper um, or, or other Japanese species. Um, you know, just looking at kind of stretching things out a little bit rather, rather than the, the, the compaction. Uh, and at the moment, this is, you know, the, 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 the bark is very youthful. Um, the, the image is very youthful. But over time, the tree is going to evolve um, and we're going to be able to try and uh, achieve a little bit more of a mature image, particularly as the apex t sort of tends to fill out. Uh, so that's kind of like from a stylistic point of view where we where we where I personally uh, I'm looking at it. other people maybe not agree with it uh, want to do something else but you know I'm just here talking about what I do uh, what particularly what I do with large um, but you'll notice what we did with uh, with the branches and the the, the arrangement of the, of the foliage pads that's been knocked um, uh, has was to to try and really maximise the volume that was filled with a with a very few number of branches. We'll try and get as few of the few branches coming from like secondary branches coming uh, from from the from the main branches we can to try and avoid that kind of coarseness you know, try and avoid that bulking up of, of of the the primary branches and things like that so really maximizing the the, the use of the of, of those branches is, is is a key thing to do and so by tweaking that branch we were able to see a lot more green All right so we, every single uh, sort of bit of foliage has, is, is now sort of filling its own space. It starts to get a little bit denser up here, where the like the you know the the, the, the apically dominant, the strongest part of that branch is going to be. But really maximising what every little bit of green is 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 something which is important for large, but it's important for all species of trees. You know when we're when we're looking at styling bonsai and things like that. Um, so making sure there's no conflict between branches is, is a key thing to do. Okay. So that's a, a, a kind of like a quite a basic um, kind of introductory uh, type of uh, you know sort of tree. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of stuff uh, available out there. I've bought um, uh, like this tree here, for example. Uh, this was a five ten pound 
piece of material originally uh, from um, Chris Thomas uh, from Wales. He was uh, you know, he collects them from, from, from in and around the, like the Welsh um, forests and things like that. Um, and you know, it was, wasn't anything like this uh, originally. He just kind of did something a bit crazy with it. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. But yeah, it's, there's, there's plenty of kind of like cheap material out there. So when whenever you go to shows and things like that, there's you know these kind of um, you know, Yamadori type, type trees are out there for, for relatively cheap, you know, a, you know, affordable piece of material, uh, and even potentially some type of garden centre stuff as well uh, could be out there. But just remember what we said about garden centre things in terms of the root systems. But you know, with just a little bit of kind of um, thinking about the, the you know the aesthetics and the design principles behind large, you can kind of come up with a, a relatively interesting uh, image quite quite quickly. Um, and we've got another very kind of um, interesting uh, large concept um, to, to show you. Uh, and I did mention in the text, uh, Instagram and, and Facebook, that we had a, a very special guest uh, going to be joining us. Uh, thankfully, um, due to, well, unfortunately, I should say rather, rather thankfully, um, sorry, uh, due to social distancing and the fact that um, uh, Flyby went out of business. Uh, he wasn't able to join us. Uh, but I asked um, Ian Young to, uh, to to just take a, a video um, and send some pictures of a, of a tree that he has, uh, which I really, really love uh, because it is kind of like true to a lot of these aesthetic principles. So um, we'll have a, a look at this uh, video that Ian very uh, kindly sent me this morning. Um, and I edited it for you. Okay, hi folks, uh, Peter's press gang me into talking about this larch for some reason. Um, hopefully you'll understand my Northern Irish accent. So he wants me to talk a little bit about the tree. Uh, this tree was collected in 2015. It's not that old a tree, but it was grown on a mountainside near the tree line, grazed by goats and wild mountain goats and sheep and stuff. So there was some character on the tree, although the bark itself is still too mature um, to become any sort of great age but I find usually within 10 years in a pot they start to plate up quite nicely. Um, so Peter has some of the photographs that he might be able to show you of back just before it was started to be worked. Um, you can see that bit of dead wood was natural it was being stripped by the goats on the mountainside. Um, this, this tree had the main trunk line as you can see coming up and um, the obviously that had been the main leader and it died off in nature and then this other trunk line here went on up the, up the tree but a lot of the branches on it because these were all branches were quite long and leggy and I suppose using Ryan and Mirai as a an example I sort of fell in love with the multi apex technique and one of the things that I found it really useful for is trees like this that have long leggy branches that you can create trunk lines instead of, of big solid pads and create a lot more detail on the tree and uh, just make a more pleasing image. And you can see that it's, um, well, it's to my taste, whether you like it or not, doesn't really matter, I suppose. Um, there's a few angles that I quite like it from and I haven't quite sort of set it in stone what the front's going to be. It's still early days, it doesn't really matter at this stage. But you can see, um, a few different lines on this. This was actually a tree that was probably the first project tree that was looked at by a study group I started here in 2017. So the first styling was in 2017. That's been wired, I think twice since then. Um, they do need wired a lot within the first few years of work because they, they spring back a lot. They're very uh, phototropic and the branches will rise throughout their lives, to be honest. Um, I always wire with aluminium because they do fatten quite fast as well. So there's no point wasting a lot of copper wire on a tree and it bites in quicker as well, I find. So using uh, heavier aluminium seems to, to work better. But when we set it down in front of the, the study group as raw material, I asked them what they seen in the tree and we looked at a, started off as a twin trunk tree um, and then Somebody suggested a triple trunk, uh, which was great. Um, and when we got into styling it, um, I decided to try and get as many apices as we 
we could out of it just for the crack and you can see here we have the the bottom branch which um, did have a little bit more movement in it but it's uh, sprung back a little bit again being a large so that'll maybe need to be readjusted again so that comes out that's quite um still quite light and i'm letting this extend on out in a few places here just to help fatten the branch which shouldn't be a problem on an arch and the tree has been pinched back once already this season uh, it was repotted this year as well so um you can see here and uh, just done a big bit of a training pot not a bad uh, base on the tree plenty of fertilizer to, to get the growth that i want out of it you can see one two three four five handfuls of fertilizer on that um, quite a big needle as a result of it, but again, I'm not massively worried about that. We're, we're still building structure on the tree. Um, so that's the, the bottom pad coming up into here. Then this little trunk line that came here. We have a little apex sitting in there. And another one on above it. And this one rising up into here. We have the main leader at the very top there was one behind it in the previous styling which was stripped back and made into deadwood um and what was just a pad or one branch at the back has now early days is going to become an apex at the back this tree if we're just looking at it side on was very flat at the back there was nothing there initially to be honest um and there was a strange branch that came yeah, so this one here that the that apex is, is from was, was the only branch really at the back, which was actually grown through the gap in here and then brought back through into here and up into that apex. But uh, this branch here, as you can see, didn't exist when it was collected. And they're so vigorous when they come out of the ground. They've got so much built up energy. Um, but in those first couple of years, um, I give this two years in a, in a pot before I uh, did anything with it. And um, within those two years, that, that just became from a, a bud, just like this, and extended, just let it free extend out and was able to create a full branch out of it. And um, this one's been brought back in, and this is the back. So this is sort of brought around. So when we have it from the front, we're able to see a little bit of peekaboo coming through at the back to maybe hide that, um, give a bit more depth to the, the image there. So um, I've shared it a few times on social media. As, as my want and uh, a few people said about the, the the straightness of this and how they would shorten that in or remove that altogether and I'll to be honest with you my view on this is this tree tells a story that shows the history of of this tree that used to be the leader and is now dead and you can see the age of that even for what's not really a very old tree it's got a good bit of character building in it and uh, I'm leaving that. I have no problem with straight lines and trees. Um, and if you step back and look at that tree, you see a lot of straight lines on it. Uh, but trees in nature, large, have straight lines, and I don't mind that. Um, but within those straight lines and those apexes on this, this tree, I think there's a bit of movement, a bit of flow. Um, gives in a nice image to spin that back around to there, which I quite like as well. So that the movement from left to right, uh, I think works quite well. It needs another pinch before too long and um, we'll make a decision on when to, to take out those tips so that it doesn't continue to fatten the branch too much but i won't be pinching anything that's further in and um, behind so like on that pad here we can see these tip ones probably be uh, nipped out shortly and we have some of the interior ones that i'm going to be allowed to extend on a little bit it's still a little bit pointy and very immature in the apexes still that's just because it's early days the end of day a tree was only collected five years ago and had nothing done for two years i think it's coming on uh, quite well um that's me hope that's of use to peter and any of you the guinness is just for scale honest thank you very much ian uh much appreciated um, one of the reasons why I asked for that tree uh, specifically is because it is a very good example of taking bonsai principles, bonsai ideas, bonsai aesthetics, and then applying them to a piece of material that doesn't necessarily conform to uh, conventional, you know, those con conventional aesthetic ideas. Um, but it stays true to, to what bonsai is um, as a representation of 
um, of, of the natural world around us um, from, from both a personal and kind of a cultural perspective. Um, and the techniques that are being applied there are, you know, exactly the same for, for, for no matter what kind of sort of styling uh, gets done. And one of the things you'll notice about uh, what Ian was saying there in terms of the pinching is that he'd, he had pinched out some of the foliage uh, first and was getting a second flush of growth. The reason for pinching that out is to, to help to, to, to kind of stop the, the, the strong areas from getting too coarse uh, and to assist those weaker areas on the inside. Uh, but that sort of second flush of growth um, will be important, particularly, maybe not so much for, for Ian, uh, being up in, um, um, in you know, Northern Ireland where the, the temperature doesn't <laughs> get much above 20. Um, but, it, you know, people in, in, in hotter climates, they would definitely be needing to have um, that either first flush or second flush of growth uh, extending out a little bit more. So there is that um, more um, breathing surface area. So the ability for the, for the tree to, to, to lose its foliage, uh, to lose its uh, to lose heat through the foliage. Um, the other thing that you would notice uh, is kind of like the sparsity of the of the of the of the branches. They weren't like super dense, and Ian had clearly been through uh, and thinned them out, so that we were getting that good separation between the branches. They go left, right, left, right, left, right. You know, getting that nice um, even separation there, which is uh, which is an important thing. I made a I made a really good video of that. Um, uh, except it was all out of focus um, and stuff like that. So it's a, a bit unfortunate. Um, it didn't work out. But uh, one of the questions uh, that was asked in um, in the in the chat from uh, from Ray was about um, uh, how do you see the latch pad uh, developing a fan shape or something different? Uh, now, what I sort of tend to to see and think of is something which. Is a bit more of a sort of triangular shape um, when they're when they're younger, uh, and then that becomes a bit more a rounded shape, but not as um, kind of like fanned out as um, say we would be looking at with uh, junipers or um, uh, sort of you know sort of the, the white pine type, you know that real mature looking white pine image. Because if you remember back to um, even the, the the mature tree slideshow. Let's get back to that. Uh, this one here, you know, the, if you look at the on on the older, more mature tree, those branches are still very thin and long. They don't grow into into big sort of fanned um, foliage pads. Uh, however, you know, you you see that that sort of density um, of of branching which is happening so you, you know you've got that big sort of clusters of branches and, 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 a, and a great density of foliage it's not just one long thin shoot sticking out but it's not that um really rounded uh fanned out shape that we would make with with junipers and things like that and so that's the that's the kind of the the way that i would look to to, to to kind of create the foliage path a little bit more if that makes sense Right, um, the one tree that I really uh, have been kind of like exploring the um, the, the larch aesthetic and how we grow them uh, is uh, this one that I picked up from um, from Willowbog, uh, and this is one of my favourite trees in the garden. Uh, this was growing up in uh, at Peter Snart's nursery, Willowbog. He collected it himself, um, and I'd suggested it to to a number of um, of people up there and nobody really took it because it has so many kind of like what we would call as as, as faults um there is a massive bit of inverse sort of, not, not massive there's a there's a bit of inverse taper in the middle the, the nabari looks terrible oh i think we're dropping some frames the internet's going down or is it just because we've got a picture up um uh, sorry, red lights are flashing. Um, but yeah, it's got some some what we would call um, uh, some faults um, within the within the, the the tree itself, and a lot of people didn't like it because it had that um, the structure that was not 
Sorry, just checking the streams. Okay, uh, it's not kind of uh, conforming to the, the the conventional ideas. Um, but I I've had it for a number of years. I can't. I don't have a picture of it when I first got it. Uh, it's the same picture. Uh, but here's some of those from the area. So that kind of um, big uh, area of um, inverse taper in the middle where that deadwood um, was created. But you know, it's all of those branches are long and thin, and we have a lot of kind of weaker branches at the bottom down here. Now they, they were kind of like deliberately left uh, to, to kind of get weak. Uh, the way in which like the foliage pad's been created on this is rather than try and create a, a very lovely rounded foliage pad, um, just have lots of kind of um, those youthful branches just pushing out. Okay, oh, we seem to be back up and okay. Good job we have pictures of them. Um, you know, sort of a lot of those youthful shoots just pushing out um, making the uh, sort of covering the, the you know the, the volume of the tree as it were, uh, and then once, once we get up into the apex, it's a it's a similar type of thing. Now the the challenge that I've always had with this tree is trying to, how to make it look natural, but also keeping it strong and healthy, um, and in the in all, all the right areas, uh, not allowing it to become too coarse, um, and not making it too too sculpted and it's been it has been a challenge and uh, one of the things that has been a, an issue is the, the development of you know cones and flowers so what you can see here is a lot of um, cones beginning to form so last year it formed quite a few cones and where they um, formed uh, the branch kind of like essentially died off um, because a lot of the energy went into the into the cone formation and so we pushed it to, to, to kind of like the limit of how, um, how many cones we allowed it to form and, and lost one or two branches, so like lots sort of secondary branches, tertiary branches as a result. So this year what we're going to do is going to take off all of these flowers, um, all, all of the, the cones that are beginning to form uh, as soon as possible so we're not wasting any energy. And we are fertilising it very heavily in order for it to, to, to push through. So we pushed this tree to the limit last year. This year we're just going to leave it to, to do what it wants to do. Uh, allow these, leave these big long extensions out. So the starting of this tree has been very much just to let them, let these long elongated shoots develop. We do have secondary buds on the inside, things to kind of like cut back to, but these are being restricted and they, they do die off. Uh, as a result of that very apical uh, extension. Um, it's been allowed to go a little bit too much, so we're just going to look at cutting back some of those, bringing it back in a touch. So removing the, uh, the little proto cones, just going to go in and just kind of cut them off at the base. Try to leave as much of the foliage on there as, as possible. Nothing is going to extend out from, from where we've cut from here. But there is still extension happening at the tip, so we'll just so allow that to continue to, to happen. These old cones that formed last year, they can stay on. All the energy has gone into them. There's going to be no extra additional energy wasted. Okay, it's so just a short one there. Um, but that was just uh, a little bit of... Uh, kind of a background into to, to kind of um, letting it sort of deliberately letting it um, both flower and uh, then turn to cones uh, this, as I said this tree's been like a, an experiment in kind of like how much we can uh, you know allow it to revert to nature in order to try and get that natural uh, image um, and kind of how much you need to be uh, interacting with the tree or how much you need to kind of like pull back uh, last year I felt I, th I think I let, let it go a little bit too much um, I left too many uh, cones on there so large will flower quite profusely um, some years and, uh, and other years not so um, I don't know exactly again same thing with um, uh, with, with, with pines uh, I don't know exactly the reason why some years they do and some years they don't if anybody does know that um, then, then please tell me um, but leaving those, allowing those flowers to kind of like um, both the male and the female flowers uh, to, to grow and develop um, 
is uh, and then turn into cones is, is very energy draining on, on the tree. Uh, and so last year, even though I did allow it to, to cone up, um, I fertilized it very heavily and allowed a lot of kind of uh, green growth uh, to, to kind of like generate the energy that was required for um, for the generation of, of cones and such like. If I was cutting it back and allowing that much flowering and, uh, and cone production, um, then there would be a much shorter, much less um, photosynthetic surface area, so less energy generated, and so then the tree would be suffering. And I think a lot of the issues that people have had with uh, larches becoming weak is that not allowing it to kind of like grow out enough. Um, in that, that case last year, I think I, I let it go a little bit too much, and I really should have taken the flowers off um, a lot earlier and not even let it get to that, that cone stage. Um, it was one of those things that was one of those jobs that was always on my list to do, but the tree's massive and I could, you know, just, it, it just other things kind of got in the way, uh, like live streaming, things like that. Um, but as I said, we'll, we'll fertilize it and push that growth, push that growth uh, and let it get through. But there was a deliberate kind of um, allowing branches to weaken and die. It had a few too many branches on the tree um when i sort of first had it and was first looking at styling it and it was just a question of kind of like okay well how can we let those branches kind of like die off naturally where's the tree going to want to grow where where rather than me telling the tree where to grow let's just ask the tree where it wants to grow and see where it's going to happen and, and how it's going to um, uh, evolve uh, and so there was kind of a, a, a hands-off approach that perhaps was a little bit too hands-off um so it Got pruned back a little bit today. Um, some of those real strong areas go, um, have, have been sort of uh, brought back into check. Uh, it's going to get pushed fertilizer. The, the growth tips are still there and, and still beginning to push. Um, it's still pushing a little bit. And so now, after having fertilized it heavily, and you know, it'll, it'll, we will get that sort of second push of growth to come through. Uh, and so we'll look at ramping up the, the energy for the for the rest of the year, uh, and then look at uh, a prune back once the once the leaves have dropped off. Uh, so that's kind of like where we are with that tree um, and I know like Ian said it might not be to anybody's taste but I, but I don't care it's mine um, same thing with, with, with this one here um, which was inspired by uh, a trip to uh, Yosemite uh, in, in America with, with Mr. Snart uh, we saw tr trees kind of like growing off the, the sides of mountains that would kind of go down and then just that bolt straight upwards uh, so rather than kind of like cascading down we were seeing like completely straight trunk trees growing off the side of a mountain. Um, very interesting to see that kind of the relationship between the, you know, the apical dominance and the it kind of like being plant, you know, a seed growing on the edge of a mountain. Some uh, landslide, hap slight landslide happening, the tree kind of half falling off, but then reverting itself back up to to, to normal. So that was kind of a um, as we were driving through um, on seeing those trees. We had a discussion about why we didn't see that that sort of style in uh, in, in bonsai, so I decided to make one. Um, but uh, anyway, I dig digress with that one. Um, so that's pretty much as much as I was kind of like wanting to, to sort of say about it. Um, the thing about larch is that summer care um, and making sure that if they are being cut back, then they are not going to be subjected to intense heat uh, because they won't have that capability of of um, uh, of cooling themselves down and also making sure that the branches aren't becoming too coarse that thinning out uh, as we sort of saw with the the, the the styling of that we're making sure that we're sort of thinning out um, uh, the branches so that we've, we've not got too many branches sort of too close to each other and therefore causing inverse taper and swelling and things like that uh, is, is a key thing to do and what we'll do uh, later on in the year once the leaves drop off uh, which is a good time to another good time to sort of go in and, and look at pruning them we'll, we'll kind of like focus on that a little bit better and i'll make a video that's in focus this time um so the only other thing to do is to just uh, answer a couple of the questions uh ray question what about watering they like water yes um but yes they do uh, so again they don't don't let them dry out too much uh you know when they're the only thing about them when we say outside about the, like the sphagnum moss and things like that uh just you got to make sure they don't don't get too waterlogged but they they will grow in quite um boggy conditions and things like that 
a couple of good a couple of questions uh right so jay cornish asked about larch uh are a purely winter image tree when showing i take it i've rarely see, seen them displayed in japan uh no uh you could display them pretty much any time of the year um i they have they have good all year round beauty which is one of the reasons why they they're kind of um uh, a, a great tree to, to work with um in spring when the the buds are just bursting out they're, they're very beautiful uh in the summer when they have that if you allow them to have that kind of like luscious um uh, extending foliage um they th there's a there's a beautiful coolness about them uh i display like two years ago now i think it was displayed uh that big tree uh in japan house uh, this big thing in london uh and it was just you know middle of summer it was the middle of june i think it was and the yeah this the light green tips of the foliage and it was just it was just very beautiful I, I should have pictures of it but i don't it's bad planning of me uh and then also the then the autumnal foliage so when when the when the the, the foliage is turning uh yellow and golden it's just a it's a beautiful um time to, to look at it so yeah pretty much all uh the reason why you've rarely seen them displayed in japan is because as i was sort of saying earlier they used to use them a lot uh, but because of the branch, branches becoming so coarse, you know, uh, through being held back uh, in, in bonsai cultivation, um, the, you know, they, they become coarse and, and ugly, basically, knuckly and ugly. And they kind of like then need to be removed and rebuilt, removed and rebuilt and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and eventually you, you just end up running out of branches. And that's kind of what, what's happened. Um, the other question, which I am going to get back to is was from uh, graham about pests and diseases uh i've lost it now but yeah about pests and diseases uh really the only big thing that kind of like got to to worry about um you do i you have seen like some uh some caterpillars eating the foliage and things like that um but i've never really had huge issues with them uh, i don't know if anybody else out there has um but i don't tend to to sort of see anything majorly wrong with them the the, the things that i sort of tend to see um happening are um issues of um people cutting them back too much or not allowing them to grow and therefore you ending up with like root issues or you know not enough energy in the tree or like like i did you know just allowing too many um uh cones to develop uh, you do and can get some uh, like woolly adelgids in the spring uh, I haven't seen any this year uh, on mine. Uh, I do remember having them like three years ago, um, but uh, but yeah, apart from that, there's nothing too bad. I did put a link in in the chat, which is about sudden uh, larch death, uh, sudden oak death, um, which is uh, a fungal disease, Phytophthora, uh, which has spread through, particularly in the west of the country and, and, and Northern Ireland, very wet areas. Um, which is a fungal disease, but you shouldn't really be having that in in like a more urban areas. This is the type of thing that sort of spreads through forests um, and such like. Um, but there's a, a list of yeah, so the caterpillars. Um, the uh, does the, like if you have a look at that, there's a list of um, kind of symptoms and things to see. I've never seen it in uh, in, in bonsai, um, but it's it's like a canker sort of thing so it's you start to see um bleeding on the trunk uh you know, stuff that's not normal um a, if you looked at the that symptom and said withered and blackened leaves or needles leading to die back for the out branches <clears throat> quite often what you would say what i would say is that that's down to to, to cultivation like for, for bonsai people, that kind of symptom would be, would be more down to, to kind of like cultivation issues rather than uh, sort of phytophthora for, for us in the UK. I mean, if you lived in the middle of, of forests and things like that, then it would be an issue. Uh, but say, for example, you know, Peter Snart up there, we've, he lives in the middle of, of, of large forests and uh, never sort of seen issues like that. So, you know, there's nothing really, I, I think, to, to be too worried about um, on that aspect but yeah just caterpillars and, 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 and stuff like that occasionally you, you you will see uh so if you do have them soap spray basic uh, pesticides and such like would be um would be the way forward 
Okay, so uh, we had one or two little tiny technical details there. I think that was the uh, my internet connection dropping off, um, despite we were on a, um, a hard cable and, and, and such like. Um, so I hope that's uh, that's sort of given you an insight into into some large based um, knowledge and, and ideas that we have here and, and that people are kind of exploring um, with, with Japanese large. Um, the, the key thing is that the, the courses of branches um, when you're looking at them. So even if you style them as um, uh, kind of a traditional Japanese sort of styling, which is you know which is fine. Don't there's no there's nothing wrong with that. Um, then there has to be a plan for what happens when the branches become too coarse, when the twigs become too coarse. You've always got to have this kind of idea that in five six years time there's going to be need to be a major prune back in order to get rid of some of that incredible density and incredible courses that will happen from keeping the trees compact uh, and so just having that at the back of your mind as you're sort of styling and designing trees like this one here for example has got way uh, far too many branches on the trunk than perhaps we would really realistically need for that kind of very sort of conventional styling uh, but as this one here becomes too coarse, we can remove it and replace it with a thinner branch. And then we get another five, six, seven years out of that one. Then once that one becomes too coarse, then maybe we come back in and replace it with a thinner branch, things like that. Uh, one of the questions was about um, was about back budding. Um, I hope that like Ian's giant kind of uh, Yamadori explosive um, growth scenario uh, kind of answered that. You will get back budding on younger wood if the tree's like super vigorous um but once you start to, to kind of like bonsai them then then they don't tend to, to back but as, as freely um unless they're super vigorous really basically so i think that's about as much as we need to be we're just over an hour and ten so uh we'll knock it on the head for this evening um thank you very much for joining us um and uh we'll try we're we going to try and do um uh, something interesting on um, Wednesday, most likely. We'll just have to check the bonsai mirai schedule um, uh, and not clash with that. But it's uh, like going to be uh, likely to be Wednesday. Um, and what we're going to do is not look at any sort of techniques or aesthetics, but look at the effect um, that bonsai has on mental health. Um, I was driving the other day and the radio uh, was. Um, lots of people talking about like mental health issues in um during kind of particularly uh, like anxiety and stuff during lockdown uh and how barbers and sports people all these different things are, are kind of like um coping with um the mental mental difficulties of um of, of life and i was just sort of sat there thinking it wouldn't be good if they were all doing bonsai because uh bonsai is very very has very very positive effects for for mental health uh, and so we're just going to have a look at that and talk about that. And um, yeah, it might be a interesting kind of uh, diversion from, from what we've been doing now. But um, yeah, so hopefully it'll be of interest to you and you'll be out wanting to tune in uh, and watch me have a breakdown on <laughs> camera. Um, but yeah, so that'll be, uh, that'll be the next stream, I think. So all that's left to uh to do is to say thank you again i uh, hope you are all doing well in lockdown um and that next week brings happiness and joy uh and just to say that uh this stream has been brought to you once again in association with uh, black sheep uh, so i'm going to enjoy this uh, it's been a very long and stressful day um so yeah cheers see you again soon